Welcome to week one of You Asked For It. Yes. I am Jason, your host for the next two weeks, where we asked you to submit questions for us to address right here on stage. And for the past month, you guys just let them fly. In fact, our webpage, uh, westsidefamilychurch.com slash you asked for it, rose to the top 10 highest views of our whole site. And that's not even including all the activity that was going on in our anonymous web form, on our mobile apps, on iPhone and Android, and especially Facebook. Facebook just blew up. We got almost 5,000 page views on our Facebook page with you and all your BFFs posting all these questions, ranking them, liking them, and then voting on what songs we were going to sing today. And so you got questions. And we got a whole bunch of them, the whole gamut, all the way from tritheism versus Trinitarianism, all the way to a question anonymously that I got three days ago asking, why Pastor Jason is so crazy? <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. Today, we're going to tackle, because it's Father's Day, we're going to tackle the most interesting and highest ranking questions as it relates to fatherhood, family, and the freaky in-laws. Next week, on Sunday, next Sunday, we will deal with all the biblical questions of theology, existentialism, and if the world is going to end now that Oprah is gone. <laughs> I'm not making this up. And then, because we got so many questions, we are going to open up a special time at 6.15 next Sunday, where we're going to attempt to randomly hit all the rest of these highest ranking and interesting questions that you submitted. We're going to call it the Sunday night dump truck session. So I don't know about you, but I am ready to have some fun. So we're bringing in the big guns. He can lay out the truth like a T-bone on a Father's Day grill. He's the smoke and the sizzle with some old school grizzle. Dan, <laughs> do you ask for an answer, man? Sutherland! <laughs> Old school grizzle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. You really do make this stuff up, don't you, man? Oh, yeah. It that comes to awesome. me at like 3 o'clock in the morning. I, I know what hey, you do. Yes. happy Father's Day, And by to the you way. too, buddy. I know you're a young father and doing yeah. well. All you fathers, happy Father's Day. How about a hand for the dads? Yeah. So in, how, are, how are you celebrating Father's Day? In, I don't know. I've been told there's a surprise at lunch. Nice. So I'll let you know tonight. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Hey, we've had a great, great week at Westside uh, Vacation Bible School at Lenexa. 900 plus kids here, nearly another 300 in backyard Bible clubs around the community. Uh, yeah, I agree. Yes. Great stuff for kids. And last weekend was just incredible with the, the wrap up of What If the Church. Uh, had more than 2,500 people involved on serve day on Saturday, and then the great crowd out at uh, Livestrong on Sunday. So it's just been a great time to celebrate. Good day to be focused on families. Yeah, um, and we got tons of questions here as it relates to family. We got them from all over the place. People online right now all over the world are did, wanting to know. Did Jill show up this year? Oh, yeah, but we got some better than Jill. Really? Yeah, last year's Jill is this year's Sean. Sean, he no joke, if you get on the Facebook page, man, he's all over the place. He posted like a dozen questions almost every day. Are they related? Jill and Sean? What, the questions? Or no, Jill, no, and, Jill Sean? and Sean. Brother and sister or, you know, like. No, it doesn't seem like it. Okay. Unless That's she cool, got man. married or something. That's I don't cool. Know. That's okay. awesome. Okay. So we'll start off with Sean's question. Oh, well, wait. If you weren't here last year, Jill dominated the horizon during... <laughs> You asked for it and asked great questions. Yeah. So, yeah, Jill Sean and Sean some, this Sean year. Sean asked some cool. good questions too. But before we get into that, though, yeah. why don't you lay out some groundwork on how we're going to handle some of these yeah, questions? Yeah, this is really important. In fact, grab your notes, write some things down right here if you would. The big idea for this series, as it was last year, is Christ followers should be seekers of truth in every arena of life. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Where if you're going after Jesus, then you're looking for the way to God, which is Jesus, the truth, which is found in his book, and the life, which is in his spirit that he gives us and we live out. 
a life that is beyond measure. So we're supposed to be seekers of truth, but here's the cool part. Jesus will give us wisdom when we ask for it. The Bible says that clearly we can get our answers. So where do we turn? Now, don't miss this. I'm amazed at how many Christ followers turn to their own opinions, turn to their own experiences, turn to their family traditions. They turn everywhere else to find their answers except the Scripture. God has given us His book, and it answers by far most, if not all, of our questions. So how do we look to the Scripture? Three principles, three areas. Look quickly. First, direct teaching. There's a lot of subjects God covers directly, Jason, and we don't have to have any question about it because right. they're there. Adultery, very, yeah. very clear one. I have people say to me, you know, I've talked to God, and he's okay with us living together and not being married. No, he's not. No, he's not. He says in his book, this is not okay. And God doesn't contradict himself. So there's some things that are black and white. We have direct teaching from the Scripture. There's a second set of things that we have to use principles from the Scripture. For example, is drug addiction talked about in the Scripture? Or drugs talked about? No. But we have principles that say addiction is wrong. We have principles that say abusing your body is wrong. We have principles that say hurting your reputation as a Christ follower is wrong. So when we apply the principle, we can come up with the answer. The third one is example. And this is where you don't have direct teaching and you don't have principle. You go to example from the Scripture. I've been asked, is it okay to pray for healing for yourself? Yes. How do I know? Paul did. The guy who wrote half the New Testament did that. So by example, we can do that. So those are our priorities. And both this week and next week and next Sunday night, we'll try to refer to direct teaching principle or example. Okay, so that's the framework in which we're going to tackle a lot, a lot of this stuff. That's All right. it. So first question then from Sean. Um, I recently heard a teaching that pride in any form is sin. If I'm proud of what my children have accomplished, have I sinned? That's a great question because it gets at what appears to be a contradiction in the right. Scripture. Sometimes yeah. things look like they contradict themselves in the Scripture. It's our understanding that contradicts. going to give you a bunch of references. They're written up here. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before a fall. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud. We know that self-pride is wrong from the Scripture. Bunches of references to that. But the issue is found in Deuteronomy 8, 14. I love this verse, Jason. It says, lest your heart becomes proud and you forget your God. In other words, it's when I take credit for stuff that I forget, it's really God doing it. Somebody tells you you got great kids and you say, yes, I do. They have awesome parents. You have just <laughs> crossed into pride because you're now taking credit for a gift from God. We know it's okay to be proud of good things. God was proud of Job. That's in Job right. chapter 1, 8. God's proud of servants that are faithful. That's in Matthew 25. So I think the answer is this. Pride that centers on me is out of bounds. If you say, I have great kids and it's because Marie and I are studly parents. No. I have great kids and God has done a great thing. Now what am I doing? I'm giving the credit here instead of here. There's a lot of I in the word pride. Have you ever noticed that? A lot of I in that. So don't take credit for what God has done. Okay, great. Um, another question from Joshua. Talking to a Catholic friend about Jesus' siblings, his family, um, he thought he didn't have any. I say the Bible mentions it. Who's right? So the question is, does Jesus have, have brothers, brothers and, sisters? and sisters? Yeah. Well, technically, they're neither one right, because what Jesus has is half brothers and sisters. And if you look at Mark chapter 6, verse 3, it specifically lists four half-brothers of Jesus, and then it says you also have sisters, plural. Doesn't give us their name, but it's plural. So Jesus had at least four half-brothers, two half-sisters. Now, why half? Same mom, different dad. Everybody got that? I mean, we right. tend to forget Jesus lived in a pretty awesomely blended family. In, in fact, I think I can say this safely, a one-of-a-kind family. <laughs> right. I mean, he can claim a father that nobody else can claim. It's been claimed many times. It's only been done once. Yes, some of y'all are going to get that halfway through lunch. It's called immaculate conception. Never mind. We'll leave that alone. <laughs> so, yeah, Jesus understands blended families. Okay. 
All right. Um, okay, now Jill has a question. Go, Jill. Um, how do you raise, and this is actually a question that I struggle with, um, how do you raise your kids to have tolerance and love for other religions or spiritual views, yet teach them to be Christ followers? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, we sometimes think that, that uh, we're supposed to be so right we become intolerant of the views of other people. I think we start with love, Jason. The Scripture says in 1 John 4 is a great passage. It says God is love in verse 16. Verses 7 and 8 says if you don't love, you're not of God. John 13, Jesus says by this is everybody going to know you're my disciples if you have love one for another. So I think love is to be the dominant characteristic of the Christian. However, the flip side of love is tolerance. You can love somebody even when their view is wrong. You can love somebody even when their behavior is wrong. And sometimes as Christians, we forget that. For example, Jason, I'm pretty convinced God has to tolerate a lot to love you and me. Yeah. Anybody argue with that? I mean, think about it. I mean, God loves me when I'm good and when I'm not good. God loves me when I'm following his book and when I'm not following his book. God is tolerant of me. Yeah. So I need to be tolerant of other views and other behaviors and love the people that have that. Now, does that mean I agree with everything that's said? No. But I can tolerate it. I can, I can say, you know what? I respect your right to be wrong. I respect your right to believe what you believe. Uh, that's an okay thing. Well, and I understand what you're saying there, but when it comes to kids, I mean, especially younger ones, Yes. trying, I don't know, it's just a tension that's tough for me as a parent to manage. It's like, okay, does the kid get influenced? I mean, or do you like tell them, no, you can't play with the neighbor kid? Or do you know what I'm trying to say? I totally do. Uh, again, I think it's not so much about insulating our kids as it's about making sure they understand the love of God and what that is within our homes. I want my kids to play with other kids. I want them to experience other views, other behaviors. But I want to teach them, Jason, to differentiate between I love you, I don't like what you're doing. Hmm. I love you, I don't necessarily agree with what you're saying. Those things are not contradictory. They go together. It's called marriage. It's called parenting. It's called life. So I think it's both love and tolerance. Okay, well, that kind of leads me to my next question then, yep. that, um, when you're talking about love and tolerance, because when you look in the Old Testament, God doesn't seem like a very loving, tolerant kind of a guy. And in fact, um, Troy had a question here that kind of encapsulates this. Does God punish children for their parents' sins. And you find this in Exodus 20, 5 and 6, also in Deuteronomy, and then in, even in the New Testament, um, Matthew 23, 35. What, how, does, how does all that shake it's out? It's a phenomenal question um, and, and a tough one. There are, there are two places in the Old Testament where God talks about punishing a specific sin to the third and fourth generation. And it's found in the Ten Commandments, both in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy 5. Here's the deal. God says, I'm God, have nobody else in front of me. That's the first commandment. And the second one is don't create an idol and worship that idol. And we do that across America all the time. Our idols are success and cars and houses, even kids. Sometimes we make our kids into the idol. When we do that, it says that that can pass to the third and the fourth generation. So there's the Old Testament standard. Mm -hmm. The New Testament teaches clearly that because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, Christ followers have forgiveness of sin. So we experience a grace setting. What I believe does happen, Jason, so, is... So wait, so you're saying then that, that grace covers not just me... I believe it does. But perhaps even, you know, what... My dad did, my grandpa did. I absolutely believe that the blood of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice breaks all the bondage of sin, breaks all of the things of sin. Now, can there be consequences well, right. yeah. that pass on? Of course. If my dad is a drunk, he wasn't, and I'm raised by an alcoholic dad, that is going to mark my behavior. It's going to mark some of my beliefs. It's going to leave some consequences. Does it mean that I'm bound to be an alcoholic? No, because right. in the grace of Jesus Christ, God doesn't have grandkids. God has kids. Every generation has to choose for themselves whether or not they follow Jesus. Well, and 
Also in that Exodus passage, it, on the tail end of that, it said that, you know, God will punish yes. um, to the third and fourth generation. But the best part's the last part of the verse. Exactly, where God says that he will bless to the thousandth generation of those who love me. Yeah, and I, and I think that's the case. I mean, I have, I have a righteous grandmother that I can see so much of her godliness still affecting my parents, my generation, but even my kids and my grandkids, that's five generations deep that look to this lady as this great heroine of the faith because she was. Mm -hmm. And that influence can live forever. The folks listed in Hebrews chapter 11 and 12, Old Testament heroes that still have influence and impact on us to today. So I think the deal is let's focus on the grace of God and let's focus on being examples to our kids that they can follow. Well, being a great example for our kids is, is awesome. But not all parents are great examples. And, you know, I know that there are times when I'm not the best example in the world. I've heard that about you, yes. Yeah, and yes. so <laughs> and someone else asked this question. I thought it was really good. It actually got a lot of likes and a lot of comments on this particular question. It says, I was recently taught that we should respect those in authority. Mm -hmm. What if those in authority are always tearing you down and belittling you? How then do you show respect? It's a great question, but there's an assumption in it that's, that's I don't think, quite right, Jason. And that is, I'm supposed to respect these people, but if they're not doing respectable things, mm -hmm. I can turn off the faucet of respect. No. Scripture doesn't say respect your parents when they're good. It says respect your parents. It doesn't say respect your elders, your authority figures, your government when they're good. If it said that right now, can I be honest? I'd have a big respect problem. But it says respect those in authority and respect the government and pray for them. I choose respect because God says I am to respect them. Mm -hmm. So if they're belittling you or they're putting you down, you still practice what Matthew 7, 12 talks so about. So what does that look like, though, in like a you know, father-in-law situation or a dad situation? Because, you know, today's Father's Day. I mean, we're talking a lot about government and civil stuff. But if we're talking about family, you're living with those people. How, how do you exercise respect in that environment. Well, when Jesus said, do to others what you would have them do to you, I think that's the basis of respect. I mean, there are people celebrating Father's Day today going, I don't want to talk to my dad. I don't respect him at all. Or that's not the memory I have of my dad. It's not about was he respectable. It's about God has allowed him to be in your life as your dad and you respect it. Jason, there are moments, I, I have this particularly with a neighbor right now. Um, and it's, it's a neighbor a few houses away, but I, wow, there's nothing about this neighbor I like. There's nothing about this neighbor I respect, but God says I am to show them respect. So out of respect for God, I offer respect to people who haven't earned it because mm. God says this is what a Christ follower does. The cool part is it drives them nuts when you treat them well and they know they're nasty to you. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus says that's putting a fire on top of their head. Is that a cool picture? I mean, let me translate that. It blows their mind. It fries their brain when you're nice to them when, and they're being nasty to you. I love fried brains. I just think that's fun. I really do. Can I tweet that? Yeah, please. Fried brain. Yeah, it's in Matthew. Okay, got another one here uh, from Allison. What does it mean to leave your father and mother as the Bible says, and how do you raise your children to do this someday? Wow. How long have you been married? 18 years. I've been married 35. You've done this more recently than me. Your question. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting. My dad, when Marie and I got engaged, my dad, of course, given us tons of advice like everybody does when sure. they're engaged and then totally sure. abandons them once they get married. <laughs> um, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. That's how it works. Um, my plan. Yeah. So my dad, you know, amongst all of the advice that my dad gave me, he said, there's one thing that I really want you to do, though, Jason. Move at least 500 miles away. And I was like, what? He said, because I know me, and I know your mother, and the best thing that you could do is to establish your own home. He said, I didn't do that when I was younger, and it took me decades of our marriage to get over that. And he said, so... Move at least 500 miles away. So we moved to Paraguay. 
It's a long ways. Yeah, and it worked. Yeah. It worked. And I think the biblical principle here is, and I think Allison kind of touched on this when she said, what does it mean to leave your father and mother, as the Bible right. says? And that's kind of a principle that um, comes out of Genesis, the very first couple ever. And then Jesus actually repeats that whole thing, which is pretty amazing when yeah, Jesus does that. It is. He's talking about, even in the context of divorce, he's talking about that it shouldn't be this way, that it should be like this. Back in Genesis, it should be that a man leaves father and mother, cleaves to his wife, and there'll be one flesh. And I think the whole concept here is, is that you have to leave your family because everybody's family seems normal until you get married. And then you realize how jacked up your family is. And hers is worse. <laughs> yeah. And in-laws too. Yeah. Because you don't know any better. That's all you know is your family. Yeah. And so what happens is, and I think the Bible is so wise when it recommends this. And it says, look, when you get married, you need to leave all that baggage behind you. You need to leave what you think is normal behind you, what you think family and roles is normal behind you, and you need to create it's a big. new reality together it's good, and Jesus. create unity together. Yeah. That is what Jesus talks about, and that's what I think is the best way to do this. And, you know, for us, it worked great to move to Paraguay. Now, here's the deal. <laughs> Jason is not saying move 500 miles. He's saying do whatever it takes to leave mother and father. If you can live in the same town and establish your own deal and not live in the shadow of it, awesome. If you can't, move 5,000 miles, however far it takes. Now, here's the principle. I'm going to quote King James here. King James translation. Never thought you'd see the day, did you? Genesis 2, 24, it says that a man must leave his home to cleave, how, there's a King James word, to his wife. Look this way. The primary relationship when you're a child is mother and father. Scripture makes that clear. But when you get married, that relationship takes priority over this one. I know people that have been married 30 years that haven't figured this out. Well, mama says, well, daddy says, no, no. It's about husband and wife as a primary relationship. And the extent to which you don't leave that initial relationship is the extent to which you'll never be united as husband and wife. You can't become one if there are parents still in the mix. Does that mean you dishonor your parents? No. Does it mean when you say, I do, there's a new human authority in your life? Yes. Yes. Leave and cleave. Turn to your neighbor and say, let's do some cleaving later. Go ahead, tell me. <laughs> For the married ones. The married ones. All right. Thank you. Let's make that clear. Very clear. All right. We already covered that. First, first thing there. Yeah. Okay. Got another question. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had I'll to get that. some email on that one. That'll be good. I'm sorry. No, I like it. No, no, it's all good, okay. dude. No, it's good. Okay, next question. Yes, sir. My dad and I want to know, why do women nag men and think it's a motivational tool? <laughs> there's a simple, I'm not making there, this up. There's, there, that is the question. There's a simple answer. It works. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do love what Proverbs 21.9 says. It's better to live on the corner of the roof than in the house with a nagging spouse. But check this out, guys. It's not just women that nag. Hmm. Okay? We, they got real quiet in the room on Father's Day, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> now, here's why it happens in my house from time to time, and here's why it's difficult in some of our homes. I don't always listen well. So when my wife tells me something, she often has to tell me repeated times. I sometimes overpromise and under deliver. I'll say, yeah, babe, I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to take care of that. And she has to keep reminding me that I've said I will take care of that. Now, in all honesty, my wife does not nag me, but she is persistent. <laughs> and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. 
I, I do think we, we've got to have some, some learning on listening skills, some learning on delivery. And if you are doing right. some nagging or if you're being nagged, communicate about that because nobody likes nagging. You know, it's, it's both ends here on, the, on that scale. But I love that verse set of Proverbs. Yeah. Live on the corner of the roof 500 miles from your parents. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the learning so far today. <laughs> okay, next one. Um, how do we help a fatherless child or children celebrate Father's Day? That is an awesome question, Jason. Um, let's both tackle this. You're a young okay. dad. Why don't you start? Well, um, you know, it's interesting. Yesterday, while uh, we were celebrating Father's Day, um, we have a few traditions. We went blue. Now, you celebrated yesterday because you're kind of busy today. Yeah, today is just nuts. Uh, so it, it just wouldn't make sense today. So yeah. um, we went blueberry picking, which is my favorite, by the way. Um, my wife cooked me a blueberry pie from fresh blueberries yesterday. Awesome. She even cut out on the crust, you know, a less than three. Those of you geeks out there would totally know what I'm talking about. It was great. And, you know, kind of around the table, this is kind of our Father's Day thing, right? And Isaac asks Maria, who, whose parents, you know, divorced when she was six months old and her dad really wasn't a part of her life. Um, Isaac asked her, what did you do for Father's Day? And I had never asked her that question. It was really amazing. She said, wow, you know what? We never celebrated Father's Day. I mean, we celebrated Mother's Day. But we really, Father's Day was kind of non-existent. Mm -hmm. And, and I said... Because father wasn't around. Right, exactly. And right. I asked her, and I said, well, didn't it make you feel weird that, you know, your dad wasn't around? Did it, did, how did you handle that situation? She said, you know what? I never thought about it. Because, you know, I just assume everybody else, you know, they were celebrating Father's Day for their father or whatever. She said, for me, it wasn't so much the day of Father's Day that was the big deal. But she said one thing that was a big deal that my mom always taught me, Maria said, was that God is your heavenly father. And that got me through all kinds of situations in my teenage years and stuff like that, she told me. She said that is really the most important thing. And Psalm 68 talks about this. Psalm 68, 5 says that God will be the father to the fatherless. It does. Yeah. I think that's key, Jason. And, uh, you know, my wife also uh, lost her father at age five. He yeah. died, and she grew up without a dad. And one of the things we've tried to do with our kids, and I recommend this to all Christ followers, is we had multiple second and third and fourth and fifth moms and dads in their mm -hmm. lives, other significant adults. And that's an important thing for single parents, but it's an important thing for, for married parents as well to have other Christ followers that can, that can speak in. Um, but, you know, here's the deal, and I, and I like this thought. If Psalm 68, 5 says that God is the father of the fatherless, right. and if part of our journey of, of following Jesus is literally to love Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to share him, then as we become like God, we ought to become fathers to the fatherless, mothers to the motherless. And one thing we're, we're dreaming at Westside, and I'll just share this briefly, is uh, we're excited about what we get to do internationally for orphans, but we also know God is calling us to make more of an impact locally with orphans and in foster care and in adoption and in being fathers and mothers to the fatherless and the motherless, and I'm pretty pumped about where God is, is leading us in that. Um, celebrate Father's Day any way that you can. Any way that you can. It's a family day. It's a day to celebrate. It's a day to enjoy, and I'll let you know Tonight, Jason, if I got surprised or not. Okay, sounds great. Um, well, that's all the questions we have time for right now. Do you have any closing thoughts before we wrap it up? Well, my, my closing thought is this. If you're going to win as a parent and a Christ follower, you have to develop two things, short-term memory and long-term commitment. Short-term memory means you forgive and you move on. Short-term memory means some of us right now on Father's Day are going, I've been a pretty crummy dad this year if I could really get down to it. Fine, admit it, move on, make a commitment to do better, ask God to empower you to do it. we got to have short memories and long-term commitment because raising a family that honors Christ is a lifetime process. 
It is a lifetime fulfillment and a lifetime journey. I am proud of you, West Side, and I hope that you have an incredible, incredible Father's Day. Well, that's all we've got for today. We will see you next week when we tackle biblical theology, existentialism, and Oprah. And don't forget the Sunday p.m. dump truck session that we have at 6.15. And that next is week. it. And if you don't like it, just remember, you asked for it. <laughs>